Hello everybody, this is Austin again from Craft Crickets in Eugene, Oregon. Today we're going to be talking about processing and storing crickets in a way that it's safe to eat. To do so, I'm going to discuss the processes that we use on our farm, Craft Crickets. Now this isn't the only way that you can process cricket. There are going to be pros and cons that you'll soon see about the way that we do it, but what I'm going to talk about today results in a product that we find delicious and appeases our local health inspector. If you like this content and want more information about processing crickets, please check out our recently self-published e-cookbook, The Cricket Cookbook, which is available on Amazon, or browse our other recipe pages on our website at www.craftcrickets.com. Now, regardless of what you want to do with your crickets uh, and what form you want to eat them in, the very first thing you need to do is to kill your crickets. So, the most common way people do this is probably by freezing them. Now, as crickets are cold-blooded, they can't survive very long in temperatures that are below freezing. When placed in a freezer, crickets will go into a state of hibernation. Now, they can only survive this hibernation for a few hours. This, of course, is true in the wild as well. On a cold night when the temperatures dip below freezing, unless the cricket has burrowed himself into some warm place against a building or in some warm substrate, he will go into hibernation at night and if the sun doesn't rise, that cricket's not going to wake up. It's going to die. So, now most people will tell you, you don't need to freeze a cricket for the course of a whole night. Just three or four hours will do. Uh, that's enough to get that hibernation to switch to death. Now, if you reasonably remove the crickets from the freezers, though, before that point, uh, there's a risk that those crickets are going to resurrect again. Uh, and uh, this is not always... Something that you want, especially when you're working with your crickets and froze, uh, in the kitchen and you have a pile of frozen crickets sitting there on the counter and all of a sudden they start jumping around and what was going to be your dinner uh, has turned into a pest that's all around your house. So, well, three to four hours should do the trick. I prefer to keep my crickets in for 24 hours. Generally, I'll put the crickets in the, crickets in the freezer one day and I'll process them the next. Okay, now that we have frozen our crickets and they've been frozen long enough where we're sure that they're no longer alive and they're not going to be jumping around in a few minutes. Um, the next step, regardless of what you're going to do with the crickets, is to rinse them off. So the crickets probably are going to have some residue or poop on them and if they've been frozen, they're probably frozen and things are clumped onto them. We want to get that off. So put the crickets under some cold water, um, but don't just do it for a few seconds. Make sure you thoroughly give a shower to all the crickets. Uh, if you just take a clump of crickets and throw it under the tap for a few seconds, you're not going to get everything off. And when you process your cricket, you're also going to be processing cricket poop. And that's just rather disgusting to get an end product with cricket poop. So make sure you rinse thoroughly, and then you need to strain thoroughly. Now, at this point, once the crickets are cleaned, if you want to, you can refreeze them and have frozen crickets. Uh, or you can further dry them and further process them and make them into cricket flour. If you just want to have frozen crickets, um, that's a product that there's a wholesale market for. You can sell these frozen uh, wholesale or whole crickets too. Or it's also a very good cricket to work and to cook with. But with this type of cricket that hasn't been processed but that's only been frozen and rinsed, I would treat it very much like I would treat any raw meat. Um, consider that it probably has some bacteria and microbes on it and you're going to want to make sure that you cook it thoroughly with whatever way that you're going to make it to at least 160 degrees to kill any of the bacteria or microbes that may be uh, living in it. Now, same thing with working with other raw meats. The utensils you use and the surfaces that that raw cricket touch, you're going to want to make sure you clean and sanitize so that uh, the bacteria doesn't stay on that. Now, why would you want to eat frozen crickets uh, and just uh, process the raw uh, crickets in this manner. I like working with frozen crickets because they offer the most versatility in food preparation. They haven't already been processed, so uh, it allows you to add additional flavors and be the most creative with them. Compared to dried crickets, either as a flower or as whole crickets, uh, the crickets will have more flavor and they'll more easily take on the flavor of other foods. And because they haven't already been processed, um, they can be fried or baked for a longer period of time without a risk of them burning. So, for example, I love to make pad thai or stir-fry with frozen crickets. 
Uh, I treat them very much like I would treat frozen shrimp. Uh, just like shrimp, when I'm making frozen crickets into a stir fry, they absorb the flavors of the various sauces and ingredients that I'm using. And another option is to dry or roast your crickets. Dried or roasted crickets have been further processed from the frozen state, removing most of the water content and making a shelf stable product. Before drying the crickets, at our farm we blanch or boil the crickets for five minutes to kill any microbes. Well, this step is not entirely necessary as the microbes should all die in the drying process, we always exercise extra caution by blanching our crickets. Well, this reduces the risk of foodborne illness and unfortunately also reduces the flavor and some of the nutrition that's in the crickets. This is going to be lost into the boiling water. So if you want to be safe and dry uh, and boil your crickets, but you're concerned about losing some of that uh, nutrition to the water, I just recommend saving that water and using it as a nice cricket broth uh, that you would use in your cooking, in your soups, uh, and then that way you would be maintaining some of that nutrition. Now, these crickets, after you boil them, we then thoroughly dry them, uh, either using an oven, a convection oven, uh, a conventional oven, or even a food dehydrator. And we're drying them trying to remove their water content. Now every farm does this a little bit differently. At our farm, we bake our crickets at 210 degrees Fahrenheit for about three to four hours. And what we're doing is we're weighing the crickets during the process to make sure that they have lost 72% of their water weight. Now, when we do this in a convection oven, the crickets come out very much like a puffed rice. Uh, if we do it in a conventional oven, they're more crunchy like a seed. Uh, if in the prior step, after we rinse them, we didn't do a very good job straining them, we're gonna have to bake them longer because they're gonna be a lot more wet. Uh, and so there's two ways that we can really determine when they are done. One, we can just eat them. And if they have the right crunchiness, we know they're done. We don't want them to be squishy. If they're squishy, we know there's still water in it and bacteria and mold will form. Or we can weigh them throughout the process. Now, the longer you cook crickets, uh, the more weight they'll lose. And you'll notice there's a very linear relationship between how long you've cooked the crickets and how much weight it loses um, due to water evaporation. It will reach a point though where the weight will level off and instead of seeing 10% of the weight being lost every 10-20 minutes, the weight will stay the same. You do not want to bake it much longer after this point because then you're just going to risk burning your crickets. Uh, so like I said, at 210 degrees, it takes about three to four hours for us, but this depends on a lot of factors. Now, some farms prefer to cook at a higher temperature, upwards of 300 degrees. This means that they don't have to cook for as much time. Uh, I prefer not to do it that way, as I think it creates a more of a burnt taste. And there's also a higher likelihood that I'm gonna burn the crickets. Uh, you can do it, you can roast the crickets. We've had a lot of luck smoking crickets, uh, smoking them at 200, 225 degrees, again for about three or four hours. Uh, tastes great, tastes absolutely great. They've actually probably been the most popular crickets we've had. Uh, but you should know that each form of processing does yield a different taste. All crickets are not the same. I'm looking forward to the day when the cricket industry has established a little bit more and buying crickets will be very much like buying coffee beans where there's going to be differentiated by the location the crickets were grown, the diet of the crickets, um, and the way that the crickets were processed, and even potentially who processed the crickets. But until then, if you just go to the store and buy crickets, no matter how they've been processed or how they've been reared, they're just called crickets. So after we bake the crickets, this is typically where we end our processes at our farm. Uh, we let the crickets cool down and then we package them and sell them as dried whole crickets. Now, many people prefer eating their crickets as a cricket flour. Fortunately, this is only an additional step and can be done at, done at home in a pretty easy way. Depending on the recipe, uh, we like to grind our crickets slightly differently. For example, when we're baking brownies, we want a very finely ground cricket so that you don't really notice that there's anything different with the brownie compared to a conventional brownie. 
However, but when we're making cricket burgers and we really want to showcase that crickets are part of the ingredients, uh, we don't grind them as much. We sort of coarsely grind them so that they add a little bit of texture to the cricket burgers. So to mill your crickets at home, all you really need is a food processor, such as a magic bullet. Now, uh, it takes maybe 10 to 20 seconds to mill your crickets in one of these food processors. You can even do it in your coffee grinder if you'd like. Again, it's just going to depend on the level of coarseness that you want. Uh, a rule of thumb is that to get one cup of ground crickets, you need about two cups of whole crickets. If you want it finely ground, you're going to need even a little bit more than that. Now, if you want to grind crickets and sell the flour commercially, you're not going to be able to use your coffee grinder. You're going to want to have uh, a proper mill, and you're going to want to experiment a lot with it. Now, these commercially ground crickets are superior to the crickets that you're going to grind at home because uh, they're going to be a lot more consistently ground and they're going to be a lot finer. So these dried crickets and this cricket flour should be shelf stable and will not mold if you keep it in a cool, dry place. Even if you don't store it properly, the crickets can be fine for a few months. For example, we regularly keep dried crickets in a bowl on our kitchen table next to our salt and pepper and we use it as a condiment. We throw it on top of our food whenever we need a little extra crunch. And we've never had mold form on our table crickets. However, crickets are hygroscopic. This means that they absorb moisture from the air. So if the crickets are exposed to moisture, they can form mold within as little as 48 hours. To be extra safe, I know some customers of ours take their crickets and they store them in the freezer. Aside from ensuring that the crickets stay fresh, these frozen dry crickets also work well in smoothies or well, work, well, <laughs> work well eating straight out of the bag just with a little extra crunch from being frozen. Now, the crickets we farm and process, we've conducted a water activity analysis on them. This is a third party analysis which measures the moisture available that can support the growth of yeast and molds. Water has a water activity level of 1.0 and foods such as fresh meat or fresh fruit have very high activity levels close to 1.0, such as 0.99, 0.98. Most molds, though not all molds, require a water activity level above 0.8 to grow. When we follow the drying practices that I've just described and remove 72% of the weight by drying the crickets, we receive a water activity level of about 0.4, 0.45. This is similar to the water activity level of flour. So I like to say that you should store your crickets and treat your crickets much like your flour. Keep it cool and dry, and if it's kept that way, it will last for a very long time. But as soon as you get your flour wet, it's going to behave a lot differently. If your crickets do go bad, you should be able to notice visibly very quickly. Mold can overtake the entire package or container of crickets in just a few days. It's quite disgusting. Uh, so if you have any mold on your crickets, I would throw them out. If you eat any of your crickets and they taste a little mushy, I would throw them out. Uh, don't eat them. Okay, that's all I have today. I appreciate you guys watching this video. If you have any questions, please just leave a comment below. I'll respond fairly shortly. Additionally, please check out our e-cookbook, The Cricket Cookbook. Uh, if you're looking for more information about processing crickets, drying crickets, adding flavors to crickets, or looking for a bunch of cricket recipes. That's all for now. Thanks.